Hamilton, President of Robert E. Hamilton Consulting Engineers, and I'm Chairman of the Joy Region Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Welcome to the Chamber's March Luncheon. This afternoon, the Chamber is pleased to welcome Illinois State Comptroller Leslie geiser Munger to tell us about our state's finances. Leslie was sworn in as our Illinois State Comptroller on January 12, 2015. She's a native of Joliet, a graduate of Joliet West, and she grew up five doors from me. I just counted this morning. <laughs> Even though she's our comptroller, I still think of her as Doug Geiser's sister. <laughs> comptroller Munger earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Illinois and her master's degree from the Kellogg School of Management in Northwestern. She's a former brand management business executive with Unilever HBC Helene Curtis, where she led the $800, $800 million U.S. hair care business. Lully's been an active community volunteer in Lincolnshire and leader for the Riverside Foundation, a not-for-profit residential facility for development of disabled adults. In 2004, Leslie was named Lincolnshire Citizen of the Year, and she was named Volunteer of the Year in 2013. Comptroller Munger also served in the Lincolnshire Prairie View School District 103 Foundation Board for seven years, and spent three of those years as president. She continues to serve education in our state on the University of Illinois Student Affairs Advisory Council. Leslie and her husband, John, live in Lincolnshire, where they have two adult sons, Tom and Andy. Please give a big joy welcome to our Illinois State Comptroller, Leslie Munger. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Howard, for that nice introduction. It's, um, I did really grow up just a few doors, and I think Doug is probably happy that um, I was introduced as Doug Geisler's sister instead of uh, him. He's usually introduced as my brother, so nice to have him go the other way around. Um, Thank you all for being here today. It's, uh, I really love talking to chamber groups around the state. I talk to a number of, of groups all, all around the state because those of you who are leading organizations and businesses uh, really probably understand better than most uh, the issues that we face in the state and, um, and how difficult things are these days. Uh, you're a very strong, powerful voice for the businesses all around our state. and. Um, I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you about the issues that we face in the state uh, because the more people understand what is going on, the more who can speak with clarity and ideas about how to help us get out of this mess that we're in, the better chance we have of actually getting our state back on a strong fiscal track. Um, as many of you uh, might know, because I've been here a few times speaking, I have I come to this job from the private sector. I was appointed by Governor Rauner to be the controller after the untimely loss of Judy Varta Pinko. Uh, I have now been in this position for 14 months. I'll tell you it's been a whirlwind. Uh, but I am really glad to be here, and I'm really glad to bring my business experience uh, here to the controller's office. I find I have a unique set of skills between having both 25 years in the private sector, leading very large brands, brands that you probably used in your own home, like uh, Swab, Shampoo, Finesse, Conditioner, Degree, and First Print, um, married with um, a, a really um, many years, 16 plus years, as a longtime volunteer working in uh, helping a social service organization near and dear to my heart in Lincolnshire. So it's a good mix of skills to be the controller uh, these days. Um, I'm now going to spend uh, really the bulk of my time talking about where we are at the budget, uh, where I think we need to go to get out of this. I will leave some time at the end for any questions that you have. Um, so please hang on to those and we'll get, we'll get to that. We are currently in our ninth month of our fiscal year in the state, operating our state without a budget. And um, you, you may know this, but as a comptroller, I can only make payments on behalf of the state if I have a, an appropriation from a budget that's been passed by the legislature and the governor, or in the absence of that, a court order, a consent decree, or a statutory appropriation, some other legal mechanism to release funds of the state. So since we don't have a budget, in the absence of that, the courts have stepped in and we are now operating our state under a patchwork of 14 different court orders and consent decrees, a number of continuing appropriations passed by our legislature. In fact, right now we are funding about 90% of what we paid in last year's budget we are legally able to make payments to. The problem is that when the courts order those payments, they order payments based on fiscal 15 rates. Or worse, they order payments to just maintain services no matter what it costs. That's like opening up the spigot and just letting the money pour out. 
So we are currently um, operating our state this year with an estimated $5 billion less in revenue as a result of the sunset of the temporary tax increase a year ago. Um, combined with just letting payments run to maintain services, that we've actually overspent our budget, another $1.2 billion, <coughs> excuse me, from fiscal uh, 15. It combined, we are adding $6.2 billion in debt to what we already started our fiscal year with, uh, which was approximately four to $5 billion in unpaid bills. So we're, we are looking at ending our fiscal year right now, somewhere between 10 and $12 billion. Uh, these are just in current bills, not on pensions or anything else that's been hanging out there for a long time. 10 or 12 billion dollars in debt. Now, frequently I, um, you know, there's asked questions about why we just can't, can't get a budget in place. And I read, um, I know you all wrote a, a letter to the governor uh, requesting and pointing out some of the difficulties with this. I will tell you that we are here today because we have a fundamental disagreement in our state as to what we have to do to get out of this mess. And we have um, parts of our legislature who think that uh, we just want to raise taxes. And we have parts that think we have to do things differently going forward. And because we cannot get the, the two groups together, we are sitting at this impasse nine months into our fiscal year without a budget. Running our state without a budget is devastating to everyone in the state. But I'd like to remind you that the reason we're here is not because we have nine months of no budget or because we have one year with a new governor. The problems that we face in Illinois today are a result of literally decades of bad decisions. Promises made but never funded. Uh, budgets passed that were unbalanced. For the last 15 years, we have not had a balanced budget in our state since 2001, despite the fact that we are constitutionally required to have one. Uh, Moving bills from one year into the next fiscal year so that your budget is balanced is not a balanced budget. We all know that. Borrowing money to plug a budget hole is not balancing the budget. Now we owe the interest on the debt. And as a result of those practices, um, and plenty of blame to go around on both sides of the uh, political aisles, we are now in the situation where we are today where we literally uh, do not have enough money to pay the bills that have been obligated, um, that we are obligated to pay. Facts are stubborn things. I'm gonna share a lot of facts with you, but the, one of the facts I think you're gonna take away is we cannot continue to run our state going forward the way we have run it in the past. We currently, in the state right now, as a result of all these court orders and consent decrees, uh, on the 90% of the state that we're currently funding, we currently have built up $7.3 billion of bills that we have no money to pay. Um, we are funding 90% of our state, another 10% of our state, we have no legal mechanism to make a payment. They fall into those areas not covered by any of these court orders or consent decrees. This includes payments to higher education, our community colleges, student math grants, a number of social service organizations, those who serve the mentally ill, autistic children, um, troubled teen programs, et cetera, fall into this 10%. Year to date, we have accrued, if, we, if I think of those as bills coming in the mail, uh, we are gonna have to pay that at some point. Uh, we've accrued two and a half billion dollars of expense year to date on that. We all know that we have a um, very uh, large unfunded pension liability out there. Uh, currently, we are looking at over $110 billion in unfunded pensions. This is retirements promised to state employees, teachers, et cetera. We're gonna have to pay those bills someday. We do, um, we do not have the money to pay it. Now, in any, in any given day in the state, I have about $100 million to pay bills with. Now, these numbers get really large, and I will tell you, I'm stunned at the number of times somebody in the legislature will come up and ask me uh, when we're gonna run out of money. Um, and, and some have said, you know, are we gonna run out of money? Actually, in the fall, I was asked if I, we were gonna run out of money in the spring. And as after I just shared all these numbers, I said, I have $7.3 billion of bills. I cannot pay, we are out of money now. But it occurred to me that these numbers are so large, they're really hard for us to wrap our minds around the magnitude of the problem we deal with in the state every day. So I'm gonna make it easy for you by taking six zeros off of all these numbers and get these down to numbers you can understand if you're paying your own bills in your own home. So imagine, if you will, you sat down, you opened up your checkbook, you looked in there and you saw $100 because in any given day, we have about $100 million on average to pay bills in the state. 
you looked at the bills you had in hand piled up before you, you would see over $7,000 worth of bills sitting on your table waiting for payment. You knew you had spent more money. This is the part of our unfunded part of our government. Uh, you just didn't have those bills in hand yet, but they were going to be showing up any day in your mailbox. You would see another stack of bills of over $2,500. And if you opened up your credit card statement and looked at what we owed in our unfunded pension liability that we have to make a monthly payment on uh, in the state, you would see a bill of over $110,000. And you have $100. Now, are you going to look at that $100 and think, I can go shopping. I can go spend some more money. It's time to go to the mall. I, I will tell you that when our legislature passes bills without funding attached to it, that's essentially what they're doing. They're saying, we can go spend some more money. Um, or would you more likely look at that and say, I'm about to lose everything I have. Um, I'm, they're going to turn off my electricity. My home is going to be foreclosed on. We have to do something different. This is literally the situation we face in the state every day. Every day we have to decide, do we make the payment to foster care or do we pay developmentally disabled? These are all court ordered payments. Do I make, do I run the payroll, which I'm federally, federally obligated to pay under federal labor laws? Do I make the contribution into the pension system, which I'm, federal, I'm ordered to do so by the state legislature? Uh, do I pay Medicaid, which if I don't make that payment, we lose the federal funds that come back um, to help us uh, cover those costs. We are out of money in the state. Uh, as a result of this, we have $7.3 billion of bills piled up. And these organizations wait months for payment. Uh, we have bills in-house now that are three to four months in the comptroller's office. They sit in agencies for longer than that. We are digging a budget hole so deep. If we do not get a budget in place that's balanced and we do not start running things differently in our state, it will be very hard for us to climb out of this mess. And those who are hurt most from this are really our social service organizations in the state who serve those people in our state who are most in need. They are continuing on providing services. Um, some of them are not being able to be paid at all. So, uh, those who are don't know if they're going to be reimbursed for the services that they are provided in full. Uh, they, they continue providing services because we sign contracts with them pending a budget. Here we sit without a budget. I understand personally how difficult this is for them because um, for a, I have a nephew who's autistic and for a very long time, in fact 16 years, uh, long before I was involved in state government, I have been active with an organization in Lincolnshire where I live that serves developmentally disabled adults. Um, I've been on our board of directors when the state was a year behind and a million dollars in arrears paying us. Um, I've talked to agencies and organizations all around our state. We are essentially asking them to provide services, wait months for payment, and basically float the state. And I think it's important for us to realize how important these organizations are because if the state provided these services uh, without the help of the nonprofits that are out there doing all this, it would cost us five times more per person. Um, in fact, these organizations serve, for every five they serve, the state could serve one. So we have to keep them um, working, serving the people that they serve. So this, this is no way to run a state. I think we can all agree. And I think you know, this just points to how we must look at doing things differently. We can and we must do much better than this. So in the short term, my office has been working very hard. Uh, we spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time personally, out all over the state, meeting with organizations, talking with leaders of social service organizations, helping them where we can legally make a payment, stay afloat. We pull up payments for them when they get desperate for funds. Um, I encourage any of you who um, are connected with social service organizations here in the Joliet and Will County area, if you know of, or know of organizations that are having a difficult time, so, uh, reach out to us. If there's a legal mechanism to get you paid, we will. Um, at least get you something to help you continue doing the, the great work that you do. When we have large payments like for Medicaid or for other, um, for payroll or pensions, we have to accrue cash for a number of days in order to be able to make that payment. That means nobody else gets paid during that period of time. So this is what we can do in the short term. But beyond the short term, we must begin to move away from this fiscal cliff because it is costing us dearly. I think any of us who live uh, near, near a border of the state, and um, my husband and I live up about 20 minutes from the Wisconsin border, we've seen companies pick up and move away to neighboring states with a more competitive cost of doing business. 
The cost of doing business in Illinois is extremely high. The average workers' comp claim in Illinois is $30,000 a year. Now, just for perspective, uh, the, the cost, the average comp workers' comp claim in California is $16,000 a year, nearly <coughs> half of what Illinois is. In Georgia, it's $2,000 a year. We don't have to be as low as Georgia, but we can't be almost twice as high as California. We are losing business to neighboring states. We have the highest, um, one of the highest property taxes in the country. I think we are neck and neck with New Jersey, maybe just a tad behind. We have among the highest sales taxes in the country. Uh, we have um, hundreds of regulations that cost our businesses money. We are uncompetitive for business in Illinois, and people and businesses are voting with their feet. Our children move away from, from their home state because they can't find great jobs in Illinois because they've all moved to neighboring states. Uh, unbelievably, in Illinois, we lost more states and more residents in any other state. We lost 22,000 residents last year, any other state in the nation. And as I've already talked about, our social service organizations are um, at the risk of being unfunded. We, um, it costs us a lot of money to carry all this debt that we have. I mentioned our $7.3 billion um, of bills piled up. We pay interest on those bills in the state. and. Um, we are expecting to owe almost $400 million in just late fees and fines on those backlog of bills to the organizations that we owe to them. That is a waste of tax dollars, and there are so many more organizations all around our state desperate for funds where those funds could be better put to use. So I look at all this and I think, uh, we're not serving anyone well. We must get our state back to a place, keeps our promises to residents, provides a better value for all who are living here, and becomes a state again where people can get great jobs, where we can live, work, and raise our families. So, so what can we do? And I'll tell you that every press conference, every time I talk to a group, inevitably someone will say, well, can't we just raise that tax rate again? What if we just raise it back up to 5%? Wouldn't that just solve everything? I really wish it would be nice if it were that simple, uh, but our state's challenges now are so much greater than that. We, um, if we, if based on our spending rate, and the bills that we have built up right now, we would have to double our current tax rate. It's currently at 3.75%. We would actually have to take it to somewhere between 7 and 8% just to have enough revenue coming in to pay off the backlog of bills that, that we expect to end the fiscal year with, which as I mentioned at the beginning, was somewhere between 10 and $12 billion. Now, I don't know any legislators who would vote to raise our income taxes that high, and if they did, I don't know many businesses who would stay here with an income tax that was somewhere between 7 and 8%. So it's really not an option to just raise taxes. The tax burden on top of our already very high property taxes, sales taxes, regulatory fees, et cetera, are simply too high. And we have to remember that people and businesses have choices. They will pick up and move. So I think we need a different approach. And as I mentioned earlier, I spent my career in the private sector. And while I understand that running the government is not the same as running a business, I do believe that business principles can be applied to government problems. So let me share with you four principles that have been important to me in my business career and I think are highly relevant to the situation we face today in Illinois. The first one is you must solve the problem, not the symptom. We did not get into this disastrous situation that we are in financially overnight. We are here because we have consistently taken the easier, expedient path instead of attacking the root of our problem. The problem in Illinois is not that we do not have enough revenue. That's the symptom. With the temporary tax increase that was put in place back in 2011, over the four years that it was in place, it brought in $34 billion. And it was put in place because it was supposed to pay down this backlog of bills. We started with $10 million in um, 2011 in, back in bills waiting to be paid. When I was sworn in a year ago, after that tax increase, as that was sunsetting, we had $8 billion of bills in-house that we could not pay to pay down our bills. The problem is, in fact, that we have an ever-growing and expanding fixed cost of our government. $7 billion in pension payments 
uh, takes up nearly 25% of our state's general revenue fund is a result of promising things that were never funded and a pension ramp that is grows year by year. Medicaid has ballooned to $16 billion a year, costing our state $9 billion after we get the federal funds back. That's about 28% of our state's budget. We spent $2 billion a year on interest on our debt, again, for debt taken out because we could not balance our budget or did not have the will to do that a number of years ago. And we have, um, and, and now it costs us a lot of money because we have the worst in the nation credit rating. Total those three things, it's $18 billion. It's more than half of our state's revenue. These fixed costs are crowding out funding for all other critical services in our state. Education, social services, public safety, infrastructure. infrastructure. They've all been cut to fund these growing liabilities. There will never be enough money in Illinois to fund critical services until we solve the problem that we have of underfunding all these other things that are important. We pay down our debt and address these long-term growing fixed costs of our government. The second principle I have is that you have to build a cost savings mindset um, throughout your business and we need to do that in the government because small savings add up. Now I know any of you who are in business, you're probably always looking for ways to save money to be more efficient, to crank out a little bit more with a little less dollars. When I led the Annie Purse Spring business at Helene Curtis, we had just introduced a degree Annie Purse Spring, and I'll say it was off to a great start with consumers, but we were losing money on it, and my team and I were charged with making that business profitable. We looked at everything we did on that brand. We saved fractions of cents on our packaging, on our formulas. We found fragrances that were prefer, for, preferred but were cheaper. We changed our marketing plan. We found small savings, but it added up to millions and millions of dollars as it was replicated over every single unit. We made Degree profitable, and it is still a profitable brand out on the shelves today. I applied, applied that same procedure when I took office as comptroller. Uh, right after, within a couple of months, I told my staff we were gonna cut our budget by 10%. I will tell you the first uh, couple times, when I first mentioned that, they all looked at me like, uh, you know, we're not gonna get that money back if we uh, give that away. I reminded everyone that it's not our money, it's taxpayer money, uh, and by the way, we're out of money, and so we need to look and be more efficient. So my staff got together, we looked at everything we did in our office to find ways to be more efficient and to do things faster, cheaper, and better. We uh, had lost a number of people through the transition of offices. We did not replace those people. Instead, we consolidated departments. We cross-trained people. We brought outside services in-house. And today, the Comptroller's Office is operating at a 20% lower headcount than we had when, we, when I took over. We have the lowest headcount we've had in Comptroller Office history. I, uh, are you getting more done now than ever before with this budget crisis? We're keeping everything hanging together. Uh, and we are, uh, we turned back a million dollars last year to taxpayers in the last couple months of the year. And our budget this year that we asked for, if we ever got a budget in place, is 10% lower than we, we had last year. Every office and agency in the state should be uh, expected to do this. Third, innovation is critical to maintaining, co remaining competitive and lowering our costs. Now, I think of government as being in the service business, although um, I think sometimes some in our legislature think that we're there to serve them. I think the government is there to serve the people of Illinois. And I remind everyone that we have to be, um, have the best service possible, we have to do it at the lowest cost if we're gonna be competitive. Currently, our state has over 900 different accounts. We have over 400 different financial systems. There are so many, it is so complex, we have no idea where our money is actually, um, it's uh, tucked away in all these different funds. It takes us nearly nine months to complete our financial statements at the end of the year. And it costs us a huge amount of money to maintain all these systems because believe it or not, they are programmed in COBOL. Um, now, in the state, uh, we have two people left in my office who can still program in COBOL. They're about ready to retire. Um, most people um, in the state are operating on cloud-based systems. And in fact, I was here a year ago uh, talking to a group, of, a group of, of people who deal with social services, and one fellow told me it costs him $30,000 a year to maintain a system old enough to work with the state. I'm really proud to say that um, we, in May, I've been, my office has been working really closely with the governor's office. 
and is um, Chief Information Officer. Uh, in May, we purchased a new software system, a cloud-based system for financials, grants, human resources, et cetera, uh, that is being currently in pilot. Um, it will take us five years to fully implement this system, but when we do, it will save our state half a billion dollars a year. And the total cost to implement it is $250 million spread over five years. So these are the kinds of things we should be doing to get more efficient, more effective, have to spend a little money, but it will yield huge cost savings down the road when this is currently in place. And the final uh, principle is, and maybe the most important one for what we face today, is that growth is a game changer. Now I know this from experience, um, because at one point in time, I led the Swab Hair Care business, and I think probably most of you in this room have used Swab at some point in your life. I know it was a staple in our household growing up. It's that inexpensive brand, usually on the bottom shelf of your grocery store, your local um, Walgreens or CVS. It was a very important brand for Helene Curtis at the time. It was a $100 million brand. It was funding a lot of our new brand development efforts, but unfortunately it was declining in sales year after year and, um, and we had to turn that brand around. Now, we could have taken the easy approach and we could have just added a sales promotion or two and that would have helped our sales in the short term, would not have solved the underlying problem of Swab, which was we, through a series of price increases and not keeping our product up to date, had just become uncompetitive with, with other brands on the market. We could have raised our prices again, uh, which would have brought in more, more revenue, but would not have solved the problem again of lack of competitiveness. In fact, it would have made it worse uh, in our years. So instead, we did the opposite. We invested in the brand. We, um, we added um, a flip top to the package. We improved the formulas. We put in place an aggressive marketing plan, while at the same time taking our price down 5%. Now I will tell you, when I presented this uh, scenario to my management, uh, they all kind of looked at me like, uh, I'm not sure, it's kind of a risky plan. Uh, my, the president of our division told me that if uh, we met our share goals, he would dance down Wall Street, which is where our headquarters in Chicago were at the time. Uh, but they let us go ahead and, and uh, follow our plan. I will tell you, it was a beautiful day in Chicago about a year later uh, when we were able to announce that in one year, Swab had gone from being a $100 million brand to a $200 million brand. Our profits increased 80%. We became the dollar share leader in the hair care category, overtaking Pantene. We sold so much Swab, basically three bottles of Swab for every one bottle of Pantene, which had been the number one brand before, that we had to expand production in our plant and hire more people. We overflowed production into contract manufacturers who also benefited from our growth. And the profits from Swab helped fund the development and introduction of degree antiperspirant. We solved the problems on Swab because we made Swab competitive. We solved the problem, not the symptom of declining sales, but the problem of lack of competitiveness. And we can do the same thing here in Illinois. But it starts with balancing our budget, not only from raising taxes and increasing revenues that way, but from bringing back, um, putting in place conditions that will make us more competitive, that will bring back jobs and help us expand our businesses. And by cutting costs and making us, um, getting rid of the excess, the, the waste, and making us leaner and more competitive. It's a three-legged stool. It's costs, it's revenues from taxes, but it's also a lot of revenue from growth. And that is the way we're gonna get out of this mess that we have in Illinois. We have so much going for us here in the state. I'll tell you, I've traveled all over Illinois. We have fertile farmlands. We have world-class universities and a skilled workforce as a result of it. We have a great transportation system everywhere in the state. We have um, abundant sources of water, which many places, fresh water, which many places do not have. And we have economic hubs in our state in healthcare, in aerospace, in energy, and in agribusiness. We should be doing so much better than we are doing. We can get there, but we have to do things differently through implementing reforms like property tax reform and workers' comp reforms that will help make Illinois businesses more competitive and allow them to absorb the costs of having to raise our tax rate somewhat by treating businesses as our partners in growth and getting Illinois back on track. Because your investment in jobs, your investment in new markets, your investment fuels Illinois' growth. 
Your growth fuels our growth. So in closing, uh, I, I agreed to serve as comptroller of the state when the governor asked me because I, as you heard earlier, I'm a lifelong Illinoisan. I'm born and raised here, uh, proud resident of Troy Township. That's my shout out to you, Joe. <laughs> um, I am. Uh, I went to University of Illinois. Uh, I went to. I got my graduate degree at Northwestern University. My husband, my, and our family raised here in, in Illinois in Lake County. Illinois is my home. And I really believe in my heart that we can get our state back on track, but we, can, we must make decisions now with the future of Illinois in mind. We have to solve the problem of our financial situation, not the symptom. We have to look for ways to do things faster, cheaper, and better. We have to innovate to provide better service at a lower cost in our state. And we must improve Illinois' cost competitiveness for our businesses to help fuel our economy and job growth. We can do it, but it's going to take all of us working together to get this done. So it's been a, a real pleasure to talk to you today. Um, I am happy to now take any questions that you might have. Yes. Comptroller Munger, I'm Ben Storch with Cornerstone Services, and we serve the developing disabled and mentally ill. I really appreciate your comments and support of human service agencies throughout Illinois, and, uh, just helping prioritize payments to us. And, uh, but we do have. You mentioned a little bit about the other 10% of the state budget that's not being spent right now. I know there's other organizations in this room that are in the same position we are that we're not receiving any payment on that right now. It's really creating a financial strain on our agency. We're lucky to have a great partner with First Midwest Bank who's being able to extend the line of credit to do that. But I'm wondering if you can speak to the state's ability to honor those contracts that we have signed back to July 1, and then when can we might be able to expect payment? Yes, so did everyone hear the question? Um, it really relates to funding the social services that fall in that 10% of the state that we cannot fund right now, and whether or not we'll, we'll be able to honor those. Um, as I mentioned early, I'm legally um, unable to make payments um, from the state, which actually is a good thing, and it protects all of us as taxpayers uh, from funds going out that are not somehow legally authorized, either from a budget or from a court order or some kind of consent decree. So for those services to fall in that 10%, the only way that you can get paid now is A, to go to court, which is expensive. And I have to say, honestly, what that does then is move you from the count where you cannot be paid at all to one where now I can legally pay you and we have to wait until we have money to pay you. So I'm not sure it's worth the investment. Um, in the short term, the answer is a budget or getting some kind of um, legislation passed to allow payment of those funds. Um, but importantly, it needs to include the funding for that. Um, I, I failed to mention when I gave you my example, you all have this piece of paper at your table. It shows you what I call my kitchen table example, which shows you why that we really have no money. Um, this is where we are. So in the short term, it is can we, you know, if they can pass, you get your legislators to pass it, um, a budget, it has to be funded. Um, there's a lot of speculation right now that we might, might go through this whole fiscal year without a budget in place. And there are organizations all around the state who in good faith have provided services for the state pending a budget. Um, I have talked to the governor's office on this and I think everyone understands that uh, when we get a budget in place, and if we don't get one for fiscal 16, Hopefully we will have one for fiscal 17, and that in that legislation, in that budget, there will have to be provision that allows us then to go legally pay and catch up what has been paid, um, you know, what, what is owed to organizations um, who stuck with us this year. Um, I will say that I'm a bit concerned for some of the organizations where we have overspent, um, those where we're not even constrained to fiscal 15 expenses, whether or not we'll, we'll ever be able to make those completely whole. Um, but at least we should be able to match what was done in fiscal 15. And the governor's budget address uh, that he gave in February last month actually restored a lot of funding and a lot of those social service agencies are looking at similar spending in fiscal 15. Does that answer your question? So the, the best answer, honestly, is a budget. And it has to be balanced, because if it is not balanced, we just add to this backlog of bills. More questions? Yeah. Hi, my name is, uh, is Jared Taylor. And I've looked at this, and it's very interesting to see. I, I actually watched your uh, press release you know, a couple of weeks ago when you sat down. Uh, and kind of basically gave this, this whole spiel to the state. And, I'm sure that we'll be able to get something fixed and 
figure this out for this $10 billion budget deficit, but I really look at this $110 billion thing, which is you know 11 to 12 times more than what we're currently owed. You know, as a 27-year-old guy who just bought a house, I'm kind of invested here in the state of Illinois. And I'm wondering, okay, if we get this $10 billion budget deficit fixed, I'm looking at the elephant in the room of this $110 billion budget deficit. How are we going to be able to fix that? All right, so the, the big concern is there's the short-term piece and there's the longer-term piece. Um, the, the, the scenario I laid out with um, growth, with um, raising revenues, taxes, some, but also with some reforms that will help our businesses grow and stay here, that is really uh, aimed at addressing the 10 to $12 billion problem we have in, in bills sitting in-house right now. Um, so if we could get a growing economy and we could get out of existing debt we're in, there is more money that we could then put toward, and we're paying a lot of money in late fees, fines, and interest on debt, that if we could get out of, we could put that money toward funding our pensions. But the big solution in pensions is pension reform that's constitutional. And we must get it because we are on a path right now where it is simply not affordable. We are paying, as I mentioned, 20, almost 25 percent, I think the actually number is 23 percent of our state's general revenue this year goes up next year to somewhere <coughs> over 25 or more. Um, and these checks, that the, the, this amount of our budget goes to fund checks that go out to 2 percent of our population. It is completely upside down. Um, and, and we have promised retirements to these people. So we have to honor our promise to people who now have um, ran, did they have their career. We, we have to figure out how to pay that, but we have to get on a path to not add to it and to start to bend that curve down so we can afford it. Most states spend somewhere between one and two billion dollars a year to fund their pensions. Ours are many times more than that, and we have to start and work that down. And frankly, if we could get reforms that would even save us one or two billion dollars, that is a huge change in the revenue that we have currently in the state and will help us start to work that down. There are legislators right now who have some ideas that they are sharing and, um, and trying to get some leg legislation wrapped around. One of them is to have a buyout with an annuity at the end of a career so that there is money going forward, um, something that the, the individual who has earned the pension would have to agree to. Um, there's also opportunities to say you give up your 3% compounded cost of living allowances um, and we'll give you raises throughout your career. If you want the compounded COLA, then you have to, we're going to freeze your pensionable salary. Um, people have a choice. I believe that's um, in the mix of President Cullerton's plan. That would save us some money. But we have to get our legislature to deal with it. It costs us too much money. We can't afford it. Yes. Controller Munger, uh, I represent one of the organizations of social service that um, is not covered by a consent decree or a court order. But I would like you to comment on the scenario um, I talk to as many knowledgeable people as I possibly can. I have to make predictions about the fiscal solvency of our organization, mm -hmm. determine whether I consider our receivables to be good or not. Um, while no one I've talked with, of course, knows for sure what will happen, the prevailing prediction is that this budget will not be resolved until after the November election. I would like you, if you could, to just comment on that scenario. Um, I'm an optimist, I'll just say that, and I, um, I believe that um, I've heard that same option. I've also heard that they were going to wait until we got through the March elections, and then I've heard that we wouldn't have one this fiscal year, but maybe next fiscal year. Uh, I uh, shudder at the thought of waiting till November and running our state without a budget that long. Uh, we have organizations hanging by a thread right now with the parts that we cannot pay. And without a budget in place, we are adding billions to our debt because we have turned on the spending spigot. We are letting the courts make decisions about what we pay. And they don't have any connection to our budget. Um, the way to get this solved, frankly, is for all of us. If every single person here and everyone you know started getting a hold of their legislators and saying, we have to get a budget in place. Um, I understand that it's a multi-part group. The governor's got to be there. The legislature has to be there. They all have to work together. But I will tell you that the legislature decided on Thursday that they were going home for a month, or at least the House, the Illinois House did. Um, they're going home to work on their campaigns. 
and um, there were some who wanted to stay and try and work things out. This is not the way to get a budget in place. And there, are, as I think I mentioned, there are plenty, there's plenty of blame to go around. It's, it's both parties, decades in the making. But um, hopefully you understand that the scenario of just raising taxes, which is what um, some will want, is not practical. It will not get us out of this. And you know, the facts are stubborn things. The math is the math. We cannot bring in enough money by raising taxes. If we took our tax rate up to 5%, we would bring in um, a roughly another $5 billion. We're looking at 10 to 12. It doesn't make a dent. And you know, it makes a small dent, but it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. We pay hundreds of millions of dollars in late fees. We continue to spend money that we don't have. So we have to get a budget in place, and the only way that it's going to happen is to implore that our legislators show up and do the job they were elected to do, which was get in there and work on getting a budget. The governor, in his State of the State address, uh, said, I will work with you. I will give up on some of the things I've asked for. But they have to show up and they have to work together. It's not going to happen if they all stay home and, and don't work on it. And that's the only hope I can give you. Honestly, if we go to dis go till November, it will be catastrophic um, for organizations all around the state. Small businesses. Um, I, I was in Southern Illinois earlier last week. Uh, organizations that f provide the food for our prisons. Uh, we're funding the prisons. We're paying the payroll. Uh, we have to keep people there, but we're not paying any of the vendors that supply the food to the prisons. And a lot of these are small organizations, and they can't do it anymore. They're about to go out of business. It's not right. We have to have a budget. Any other questions? One more? Um, did you ever hear the question? The question is, shouldn't we just raise that 5% now and at least get some revenue coming in? When we raised it up to 5% before, we sent businesses and jobs out of our state. We now have a smaller tax base and fewer businesses here to fund a lot of the things that we have going on in the state. So the concern is, if we just raise taxes again and go up to 5%, A, we don't solve the problem, we bring in some revenue, we send a very strong signal to businesses saying, it's business as usual in Illinois. We're raising your taxes back up. We're not solving the problem. We're going to increase your costs. The importance of some of these reforms, some, well, it brings the cost down on the other side. Businesses, if you're going to take their taxes up, you have to give them some cost relief so that they don't pick up and move. And um, that is the reason not to do it. We have to keep our businesses here and encourage them to stay here, first of all, and then to invest and grow. And they won't do it. They will leave if we just increase costs, because they're even more uncompetitive. And I'll tell you, I've heard this from businesses all around the state, uh, in the Quad Cities, in Rockford, in Carbondale, in um, Quincy, in Belleville. They've all seen businesses move right over the border. Done? And any other questions or we're done? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Councilor Munger.